My name is Emily Gonzalez, and uh, I am here to tell you a story of courage. In 2007, I was on top of the world. I had a very successful real estate business. I had a beautiful home in Miami Beach, and I had pretty much financial freedom, which for a young age, that's a lot to have. And then one of the worst financial crises in United States history in recent years took it all away. I lost my business. I lost my home. Essentially, I almost lost all my dreams. I wasn't alone. Thousands of people experienced this drastic change. So I did what everyone who wants to know what the meaning of life is and all the big answers to the universe does. I came to India. <laughs> and I came to India not to become a sadhu. I didn't want to do yoga, all those cliches that a lot of the people from the West come here to do. I came because I finally had time to not do anything else. So I decided to go backpacking throughout the country, a four-month backpacking trip. And I think four months was a little bit too long, maybe too ambitious. So then I decided to split that time in half and do humanitarian work. And up until that point, I had been charitable. I used to fundraise for other causes. I used to donate um, to you know, cancer charities and AIDS charities. Uh, but I never really had time to do volunteer work. Like, on the ground volunteer work, so I thought this was a perfect opportunity. So I chose to volunteer at a very uh, famous world charity that started here in Calcutta. And within days, within days of being in this organization, I was horrified. What I found, I couldn't believe. We were witnessing some of the worst conditions I had seen human beings being kept in and this was a multi-million dollar charity. So my question was, where was the money going? I decided to speak up. I couldn't stay silent. And I launched a movement of awareness that got thousands of people online to ask the same question. Eventually, the international media signed on. And now that the pressure was on, this charity was forced to make some changes. But it wasn't enough. I decided to go back to the United States and sell whatever little I had left of my possessions and raise enough money to come back to India and place the children of the families that I had met in the slum communities in school. And then at that time, when I returned to India, I became friends with a very charismatic young man who I think was crazy enough, like I was, to go into the slums with me. Uh, to most of us, his name uh, is, or, or his nickname to our friends is Kutush. To the close friends is Kutta. <laughs> but Kutush was crazy enough to go into the slums with me. And I think he did it out of curiosity. He was like, what is this white dude going to do in the slums? Honestly, I was like, what am I going to do in the slums? <laughs> uh, but to the slums we went. And Immediately, something happened. My naive idea of just taking children by the hand and placing them in private schools and saving the world and then get on a plane and going back to the US, that went out the window right away. A new reality took place. All of a sudden, we were being approached with serious cases uh, of medical issues. People were running up to us and saying, please help me with this, or please take care of my uh, child, or please, I have a property rights feud. Um, and quite frankly, I wasn't ready for that. Um, it was more than I could handle. And the problems kept piling up. So we couldn't even get to the issues of education, because for the first time, I think people like myself, and maybe uh, Kutush came to the slums with an open mind and to ask the question of how we can help you. And then word spread around, so then people started lining up with their problems. And so it was not at all my idyllic of put the kids in school and the problem is fixed. I never told anyone this, so this is probably a good idea to let it out now. And for many days at the beginning of my endeavor, I went back to my little roach-infested room in Sutter Street and I cried. I had just come to India with a one-way ticket. I had very little money, and my idea of changing the lives of the people that I had met prior was being questioned to the core. I was being questioned to the core. But I was also challenged.
And every time that I've been challenged in my life, I've tried to find the courage to change the situation. Those days of crying turned into reflection, and every morning I got up and I went back into the slums, and then something really, really wonderful happened. All the people joined in. People started hearing about what we were doing, and they were genuinely interested in joining in. I think part was, what are they doing? The second part was they really wanted to get involved. All the volunteers started coming on board, and then things started to get easier. During this time, I was also doing documentation of everything that was happening in the slums in social media. And university students started coming along, and their friends started hearing about it, and all of this started expanding this collaborative effort. At the same time, people around the world were paying attention, my family, my friends, and strangers, and they started to send in small donations. So now, all of a sudden, all these problems that we had, all these gruesome medical cases, we could go back to the slum and say, you know what, let's go to a decent hospital. You know what, we have money for this prescription. That started happening. That gave me so much courage. That gave me so much faith in humanity that the job became a lot easier. I took my skills from real estate and I was able to transfer them for the work that we were about to do. My hotel rooms became storage facilities. I couldn't use my kitchen for one year in one of my places. We have a lot of boxes and everything was stocked up. Uh, they also became distribution centers. We had a lot of the women and the families coming to pick up stuff and drop off stuff and process um, prescriptions. So it was very clear that we needed a space because this was not going to be very efficient after a long time. So I took all my skills from real estate and logistics, management, organization, and I started to apply it to this cause. I decided to fundraise to establish our first center. I did this for two years. I set a clear goal and a timeline, and I begged, and I hustled, and I knocked on doors, and I asked people that I hadn't talked to for years if they could help, whether it was a $5 donation or a $500 donation. Um, and slowly but surely, that came together. And in 2013, we were able to establish our first secular school and center in Calcutta. That was a big achievement. Not only that, we also expanded our operation to the city of Pune. Now things were really taking shape. This center not only became a safe haven for the children to escape their harsh reality and come and hang out and learn and participate and question things and even surf the internet, but it also became a created lab for ideas to be tested, to be tried. And whatever didn't work, we put it aside. And if things were working, then we would implement them. Out of that, three very interesting programs were born in the last few years. The first one is AIM Game. I have a question for the audience. How many of you here started going to school after the age of 10? Raise your hand. That's what I thought, no one. A lot of the children that we work with never even get the opportunity to go to school. Sometimes by the time the parents realize that, hey, maybe it's a good idea to educate our children, they've lost the primal years of learning, of understanding the things that you and I take for granted because we've had them all our lives. So we developed AIM Game as a way to teach them from an unconventional method. School can be very boring, even for some of us. And for these kids, it was extremely boring. But playing games wasn't. So between the ages of 6 and 12, we developed a program that has them competing for a full year for cool prices, and they get all the things that we donate to them throughout the year. But what they don't see happening, and this is what us, the coordinators, are paying attention to, is that their critical thinking skills are on fire, that they are playing with the opposite gender, that they are disciplined, that they are showing up on time. Sounds like school, doesn't it? And that's exactly what this program has been able to achieve. So over a year period, once they're done with it, the best players are then advanced into private schools, which the uh, charity pays for fully. The second program is Slum Jam. Slum Jam is a program that takes professional music teachers, brings them in direct contact from children from slum communities, and teaches them how to play musical instrument, something that is usually reserved for middle and upper middle class Indian families. And it's a really fun program because at the end of their year, we throw a concert, 
and then they have to get on stage and show what they learned to not only us, the people that are involved in the charity, but they also have to show it to their community in the slums. The third program that we've developed over the last few years is an easy one where everyone in this audience can actually participate. Clothes for Help delivers clothes to people in need. Simple. The first priority is that everybody gets clothes on their backs. We go into slum communities. We take clothes that are donated from citizens all around the city. We sort them. We then take them to the uh, communities. And when we've clothed an entire community, what we do is we teach the women of the families that we work with how to sell the rest of the clothes in second-hand markets, and then they keep the income. And this is in uh, one of the slum communities in Pune that we work with. That's a sorting day and then, of course, distribution. I want to talk to you about one of the most difficult parts of charities, which is the funding process. If you look at the Pratham Foundation, that's the largest education charity in India right now. They receive almost $22 million in funding per year, or 148 crores for our Indian audience to understand a little bit better. The next charity is Teach for India, which is another great education charity, and that comes at a much smaller circle. Now, these circles are proportionate in size, so I'm trying to illustrate to you what happens with uh, the funding that these charities receive and what they do on an annual basis. And then the third charity that I wanted to show you was us uh, and our funding. Basically, Pratham Foundation was this big, Teach for India was this big at $8 million, and then Responsible Charity is a dot. It's like a flea that you can't even see. At $65,000 a year, for example, for last year in funding, that's about 44 lakhs, to put it into perspective. That is tiny. Not only is it tiny, but we're like a flea on a camel's back, but we're a mighty flea. And we're very innovative, and we're very creative, and we are actually accomplishing a lot with very little money. But what's even more astonishing about that is how that money gets collected. And I want to point your attention to this collage of faces. Every single one of these faces represents one of our donors from around the world. Some of them are friends and family, but the majority of them were strangers that saw us on social media and here as well in India and decided to join in. These are people from all walks of life. We have single mothers in there. We have students. We have people on disability that are donating three, five, ten dollars a month. We have members of the LGBT community. We have atheists. We have humanists. We have Muslims. We have Christians. This diversity coming together because they have noticed that we are doing something that speaks to them, that speaks about unity, and that it's really encouraging. So imagine if that 44 lakhs got multiplied and if our programs were able to have a better outreach. None of that would have happened without courage. So I want to leave you with two things. Number one, I think courage is not only important but absolutely necessary to change the world that we live in. When you have the ability to get that courage out of your gut and out into the world, two things happen. Number one, you change. Number two, you change other people. And then the last thing I want to talk about is privilege. Everyone, everyone in this room has a privilege of sort, whether it's the color of our skin, whether it's your educational background, whether it's how much money your family has. And when we use that privilege to advance the rights of other people, rather than just making our lives comfortable, not only do we become better human beings, but we start to shift the way that our communities behave in a positive way, and maybe, just maybe, we start to realize the change that we wish to see in our world. Thank you.